So now let's look into this thing about God, his decisions, and how he even integrates hypocrisy a little bit further. I've said it before and i got to keep saying it because it's such a shock. God likes creating. He likes rescuing. He's, I mean, if you were to humanize him, which of course Jesus Christ is in, in his humanity is just like his own deity, but each God has his own personality, but particularly the Son, okay? He likes rescuing. He likes taking something that doesn't work or isn't any good and making good on it. That's Romans 8.28. Now we all kind of understand this, but we don't know that this is what it is. Like, I just finished making, don't laugh too hard. I just finished making um, a skillet full of collards, canned collards, because I don't want to spend time on fresh. Canned collards and turkey spam. You cook the turkey spam first and you heavily, heavily um, shake all kinds of Italian, those, you know, the mixed Italian herbs over it while it fries the turkey, which has a lot less fat. And with the heavy Italian herbs on it, somehow that changes the taste, the look, and everything else about it. And then after you're done and it's crisp enough for your taste, you take them out of the skillet and then you put the collards in and heat them and then you put the turkey spam back. But I like to break it up, break up the pieces. Now, that's a silly meal. But when you're in a hurry, you don't have time to go to the store and you like the particular foods, well, then it's fun to create that. Now, a whole lot of people are more, um, what do you want to call it, um, picky about what is good than I am when it comes to food. And they will go through elaborate trouble to make other things, other dishes, other foods, other dinners. Some people are extremely elaborate about that, and they love it. God is like the master chef. He loves it. To him, it's an art that eating the final meal is like the pièce de résistance. It's the final part of it, but it's not the most important. The whole process matters to him from start to finish. He's the guy who would spend hours and hours, I've said this before, scoping out the land in, say, Italy or France or maybe even California or Texas for the right kind of soil to grow what he wants to grow to get the right pH and all the other combinations of stuff okay and he would for he would oversee every little bit of it now, there was this classic I forget the name of the company but back when I was in, in my teens there was a classic winery in California that said, we will sell no wine before it's time. That's God. Right there. That's his whole shtick. I am so totally not like that. Just dump it in a can, heat it, and eat it. So, you know, he's got a lot, I have a lot of remedial training to undergo with him. Because he's totally opposite that of that. This is what he does with hypocrisy, too. Or anything else. He likes to make good on it. Now he wants truth to be free whether he did that or not. But he does do that. How he does it, I don't know. I mean, I know parts. Snippets. We know he makes good on us by Christ on the cross. But golly, what a price that is. No one, Who of us really can even understand what that is? To be hung, hanging on a cross in pure with sins. I've tried so many times to just put myself in his place to see what it was like for him, but I can't. 
I can describe it, but that doesn't mean anything. They're words. Okay? With God, he's in everything. Because, not just because he's by nature, that's, you know, his nature. But because he wants to be. So during all the rape of Nanking and all those poor girls who were raped, I mean, the pictures are just awful. He was there. Right in the middle of it. He was the girl being raped. He was the guy doing the raping. Now that's a pretty scary thought and, and, and makes you, you know, kind of wonder, what kind of person is this? Yeah. In what way does he, you know, experience it? Well, he experiences it the way it really is. Okay, we don't. The guy who's doing the raping of the girl in Nanking. First of all, you'd have to understand why they did it. They did it because it was, the, the idea was that the Japanese felt very insecure. And they had to put down the Chinese, and this was one way of doing that. And the guys who were actually doing the raping, they really didn't want to do it. They were obeying their superiors, who said, "You have to do this because you're a you're a son of you're a son of the emperor, you're a son of heaven." Is the word that they used. And the son of heaven must execute punishment upon these inferior Chinese. And so they would get they would whip themselves up into a frenzy in order to make themselves want to rape Japanese you got to really push them over the edge before they're going to be nasty okay they ha they have to talk themselves into it it's not their native personalities of people okay I mean we all have this in our personality but some of us it's really hard to get to get to that stage okay now I didn't mean to spend a whole lot of time on this but the point is, is that to the Japanese who's doing the raping, he's not really experiencing what it is. He's driving himself forward with his talk of patriotism inside his own head that he's using to tell himself he's being patriotic to do this thing, which goes against everything else in his culture to do. God is seeing it for what it really is. God is experiencing it for what it really is to the girl and to the guy at the same time. But that's the truth of what it is and he will not shave the truth. He will not look away from it. Which makes it even more horrible and gives, frankly, the atheist even more justification for saying, whoa, if this is God, I don't want him. Yeah, I don't blame you. God doesn't blame you either. But the answer is, he is so vast and intense. And the question is, it's either all or nothing. It's all truth be free, or no truth at all. And you can say, yeah, but God can change it. Yeah, he can. But then that would be living a lie. See, truth is whatever God says it is. So if he says truth be less than free, then he's decreeing truth be a lie. So then nothing tastes good. This is the horror of life, the true horror of life. I have not learned it yet. I can speak it. And that's as much as I can do right now is if you're going to have the good stuff, you got to want to have the bad stuff. Not that you like it. But that the bad stuff is part of free. And the good stuff has no meaning unless the bad stuff is there. Now you can say, well, yeah, but that's still unfair and it taints the bad, the good stuff and it short circuits the good stuff and it circumscribes the good stuff because here's 100% and that includes bad. So then good is not as good as it could be. Uh, well, that's where God comes in with his little chef thing. 
fertilizer is used to grow trees. That tells you the whole story right there. Shit is used to make food. That's a design decision. It's funny. It's philosophical. There's no way this universe can exist the way it does. As one great big ha ha. When you stop to think about all the components of the universe and how everything depends on each other. There has to be a designer who has a pretty peculiar and in many ways upsetting sense of humor. Death depends on life. Life depends on death. That takes a mind. A mindless nature would not design that. A mindless nature wouldn't know the difference between life and death. So couldn't create either one. It would just be and then just keep being. If, if, if you were really posit a universe that God did not create, it would just be the number one constantly existing. Which isn't too different from how most people consider God anyhow. Think about it. A mindless nature doesn't know anything about change. So there would be no death. There would be no improvement. There would be no nothing. Everything just always stays the same. Be like a rock. Here's a rock. It just exists. There's no being. There's no thought. There's no nothing. It just sits there. Mindless. But once you posit a mind, that's a whole nother ballgame. The mind of God is Mr. Master Chef. So he loves taking all the bad stuff and crafting out from it, death depends on life, life depends on death, crafting out from it something stark, raving, gorgeous. That's the promise of heaven. Is that we will see whatever it is that's stark, raving, gorgeous. Because, and here's the killer of it. He likes making us. I mean, seriously. Why didn't God just... Okay, I exist. Why don't I exist solely in the mind of God? Why do I have to have a physical body and an actual existence? That's what David was asking in Psalm 139, which is totally mistranslated and abused by the apostate to try to claim, you know, abortion is murder. Then it's mistranslated. So that's the opposite of what David is saying. David is saying, you're not human till you're born. And one day I'll do the video showing that from the Hebrew, but I already did it in print. No womb life dot htm has it. The point is, why don't I just solely exist in the mind of God? Why go to the trouble of actually making me? Because the minute I actually exist, then I actually have my own free will, my own this, my own that, my own the other thing, and he's got the burden of keeping it all together. Of course, he can wipe me out at any time, but why doesn't he do that? What possible enjoyment could God get from watching me actually exist versus just having all the ideas in mind? I mean, come on. We watch movies. How many of the movies that you actually watch would you actually want that life? Most of the movies that we seem to like as humans are bang, bang, shoot them up, sex them up, money them up. But have you noticed how shallow those movies are? Would you really want to live like that? I, you know, nobody wants to be in the shoot them up. We like watching it, but we wouldn't want to actually be the, the parties in it. Not if we're sane. But think more carefully. You wouldn't want to be in the sex them up either. And you wouldn't want to be in the money them up either. Because of the reality of both of those things. Sex is messy. And it's full of all kinds of emotional problems. That's the part you don't see in the movies. But it's part of the reality of it. If it was really in your life. And the money part? 
Oh, they never really show how nasty it is to have money. I'm trying to think of what it is that money buys that I would want. Convenience, that's about it. Everything else money buys, I don't want. What do you need? How many articles of clothing do you need in your closet? How many cars do you need? And what you don't want is you certainly don't want everybody hanging on you, looking for a handout. Or because you got money, all you know, they feel better about themselves if they're around you. And they're poor company for you. What do you want that for? What does money buy that's worth having? Not a lot. You know, there's a new blush of it when you first got a lot. Oh, I can buy a vineyard. Oh, I can buy a bowling alley. Oh, I can take a trip to Tahiti. Yeah, and after about a year, that's going to be pale. Boring. But you're stuck with the money now. Now what do you do with it? Okay, you buy a yacht. Okay, you, you know, fly in your own jet plane. $4,000, you know, per, I don't know what it is, hour of burning fuel. whoop de do. When you're poor, you have certain perks. And this is the heart of what God's whole menu plan is. When you're poor, you've got certain perks that you lose when you're rich. And when you're rich, you got certain perks that you don't have when you're poor. So God likes to throw them all together in one great big salad. Or one big casserole called a polity. Called eternity. The eternal state. Kingdoms. And the interaction. The combined flavors of high and low and everything in between. All made out from the shit of this life. That just pleases him no end. The irony of it pleases him deliberately. We know that from scripture. You know, valleys made high, mountains made low. He loves irony. Okay, you know, sterile and barren kids. That's Isaiah 54, one. He loves the irony of it. Filling all in all. What was that? Ephesians one fifteen through 23 is really what he's thinking, thinking about. Suntello. That was another one. Where's that? Daniel 9, uh, 24. The LXX. Working out everything towards its end. Together. The togetherness. Soon means together. That's what he loves. The master choreographer, as Peter put it. What was that? Epichorigel. One of Peter's favorite words. From which we get in English choreography. He loves working everything together for our good. And he's willing to go to any price to do it. Now, what that ends up meaning is in eternity, as I started to say. Is a, like the Lord said, the poor you're always going to have with you. Okay, but when you get there, you are going to be somewhere in that spectrum. Toward the bottom, toward the top, in the middle. And whatever lifestyle you got is exactly keyed to you. You will love what you got. You make certain decisions down here. It results in a certain lifestyle for eternity for you. And it's all based on your own choices down here. So you got to be real aware of what choices are available and do you really want the choices you're making. Now in addition to that, you got around you, everybody else faced with the same question. We're all busy making choices. And pretty much whatever somebody else's choices are for the most part, we don't like those choices. Okay, but we're all going to be living together in heaven. We're living together down here. We don't get along too well. And we're going to be living together in heaven. And we will get along quite well. But at the same time, we've got our own little worlds. 
her own little desires, her own little needs, and God gets really excited and enjoys the fact that he's knitting us all together for the purpose of his own enjoyment. Now, the higher you go in Bible doctrine, the more you grow, the more you mature, and it takes a lifetime, the more you're going to think like this Mr. Master Chef personality. Because all three of them have got it. Father has it in a sort of fatherly way. Son has it, well, that's obvious, in a sonship way. And the Spirit has it like Mom. He calls himself Mom in Genesis 1-2. Hebrew verb there is Rahaf for a mother hand brooding over her chicks. The spirit hovered over the waters. Yeah, well, hover is Rahaf. Mother hand brooding over her chicks. So those are their three personalities, essentially. They design their own role that they want to be. Father likes being dad. Son likes being son. Holy Spirit likes being mom. And so you trace their roles throughout the Bible. You see their own personalities reflected. Those are their own choices. But in each case, notice, it's master chef, master accountant, master creator. Loving, working, everything together for our good. And we're the recipients and the beneficiaries of it. And that's what pleases them. Each one of them, in his own way. So the higher you grow in the spiritual life, the more your own tastes and your own personality is going to reflect theirs. Maybe you're more like mom, or you're more like son, or you're more like dad. As far as, you know, how you identify and see things and what way you like it. But that's the way it's supposed to go. Because God shouldn't have to put up with lesser than himself. And so long as Bible doctrine is running in our heads, he's not putting up with less than. That's why the Holy Spirit indwells us. So we're not less than because we're being indwelled. But how can he justify indwelling us? Because Christ paid. And then as a result of that, Christ's own thinking is gradually building in us, which the Holy Spirit is building line by line, precept by precept. You see why this is working? He's doing all the building, knowing full well what that eventual polity is supposed to look like, that they want. It's like this master meal that they keep on eating forever. And they already know the end from the beginning, so they're already enjoying the meal, even while it's not yet prepared. Because you got what if, or you got like goal, like what if I didn't exist, God would still know me. I wouldn't know me. I wouldn't have the existence, but he does. So it's that kind of knowledge or the actuality of the me now existing. And in a billion years from now, he knows exactly what I'll be thinking. And I don't understand this, but it pleases him. It also pleases him that Satan will be existing a billion years from now. Assuming the rapture has happened and all history is over and that's the eternal state, Satan's going to be sitting in his own lake of fire, just enjoying himself, shaking his fist at God and all the pain that God's put him through. And with him, he'll be, you know, the, the ruler over the lake of fire and all the other angels that are there and all the other humans that are there. They're all going to be busy enjoying themselves, shaking their fist at God and God's enjoying that too. It's not enjoyment like haha. -ha. Enjoyment in legal terms means to have possession of and use of. To benefit yourself or not. But the basic idea is that you can use it to benefit yourself. How is God going to use that knowledge to benefit himself? We don't have that knowledge yet, including Satan. But he already's got it. Yesterday, today, tomorrow, a billion years from now, it's all one big now to him. How can he enjoy that? I don't know. 
I can only tell you what it is. It drives me crazy every day I live. But this is how he integrates hypocrisy as meal. You know, when you're making a meal, you got a carrot, let's say a fresh carrot. And most people, in, in America anyway, we were taught when we were young, you cut off the top of the carrot and maybe you use the greens in a salad and maybe you give them to your rabbit. You cut off the bottom of the carrot and you throw that part away. I don't know why we think that part of the carrot has to be thrown out. And, and in America anyway, they'd like to, you know, pe um, peel the skin off carrots. I'm not sure why they like that, but they did. It was very common when I was growing up. It was considered improper to serve a carrot without it being, you know, peeled. Okay, if that's what you want. But notice that those parts that you're throwing away or giving away, and every one of us will say the same thing, oh, but isn't there some way to make use of it? Yeah, that's what he's doing. The stuff that actually goes into the plate versus the stuff that you use to start the cooking with, well, there's a big difference. So what happens to the part that got wasted? Maybe it didn't get wasted. And it could have been wasted. If God wants to waste something, why not? But he doesn't like to do that. If anything, you could call hell a waste. That's what's got the Calvies all bundled up in their knickers. Calvinists all think that if somebody, that Christ paid for you, but you still go to hell because you didn't believe that that wastes Christ's payment. No. God got the payment. If the person going to hell didn't want to get his portion that was saved up for him on the cross, that's the person's problem. Notice how it always means so that the person can change his mind. Because the payment really was made, and it really was made from Christ to God. So you can always get out of hell. Legally, God is not, what was it? God is not willing that any should perish, but that everyone should come to a knowledge of eternal life. Something like that. Second Peter 3, 9. Uses the words may and ook, means denies the idea and denies the fact. God is never willing that any should perish. Well, if never means never, then, you know, in hell a billion years from now, because Christ paid Father, and somebody in hell a billion years from now might say, you know what, this is really stupid to be burning all the time. Uh, I believe in your son. I believe in Christ. Don't you think God would zap him out of hell immediately? Wouldn't that be pleasing to God? So it's not a waste. So God doesn't waste nothing. Romans 8, 28, he doesn't waste. He loves the cost, the hassle, the process, the fact that it's never complete. Me, I need to stick it in the bowl, stick it in the microwave, and it better be cooked in two minutes, or I forget about it. That's not him. So when you see your own or somebody else's hypocrisy, and I, I'm using this now and newly because I'm so upset about Windows 10. When you see your own or somebody else's stupidity, callousness, deafness, disgustingness, hypocrisy, understand that Romans 8.28 is true. That's his recipe for creating, and he loves it. Every single minute. It doesn't have to actually occur for him to love it. And when it's in the process of occurring, it doesn't have to actually be finished yet for him to love it. Because if you start to understand that, then you better understand him. And what the hell else is it for to be a Christian but to see him? Peace out.